So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining uh, me and the good to see everyone. We are advancing through the Torah. We are going forward through the parsha, Parshiot, the portions. And we're coming to a part of a tour where we're going to we're less narrative. We're going to be focusing more on individual little aspects because it's just the nature of the what we the material we have. Um, so this week Tetzave is um, uh, uh, actually the the parsha where I first visited Temple Harzion eight years ago. Um, so this was uh, parsha I remember well, um, and uh, it's all about the big de Kohen, the clothes of the high priest. Um, and other related uh, subjects to it. Um, so we're going to be we're going to be looking at a, a kind of small part in the Hebrew, but talking, I hope, in detail about um, the meaning of all of this and why why is this important? Why 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 are the clothes of the high priest important? And what were these clothes? And um, why was it important for him for others? Why do we read about it? What's it all about? Um, and uh, we shall be uh, not spending too much time in the Chumash because the verses that we'll be reading are, aren't, aren't that long, um, but more with the commentaries and in discussion. Um, so let us start, as always, Alan holding up the port, Tetzaveh. Chapter 20, 27, verse 20, 27, Exodus, verse 20. You shall further instruct the Israelites to bring you clear oil of beaten olives for lighting, for kindling camps regularly. <clears throat> Aaron and his son shall set them up in the tent of meeting. Outside the curtain, which is over the Ark of the Pact, to burn from evening to morning before Adonai. It shall be a dew from the Israelites for all time throughout the ages. You shall bring forward your brother Aaron with his sons from among the Israelites to serve me as priests, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Itamar, the sons of Aaron. Make sacral vestments for your brother Aaron for dignity and adornment. So I, I've got to stop you here, Alan, for a second. My my daughter who's sick, I can just hear her calling out. So I'm going to run over to her, spend uh, one minute just to uh, orientate her uh, what she what she's going to do. Um, so I'd like uh, everyone to have a little discussion. What makes sacral uh, vestments for your brother for dignity and adornment? What does that mean? What what are those? And see if Phil has an alternative translation or anybody else. I'll be back in one minute. What is that? Well, the uh, the clothing, of course, sets them apart. It's kind of like a uniform, right? Because all the priests, all the priests are directed to to take on this this clothing, right? And it is, it's color coded, right? It's, it's red and blue and purple threads and, and, and fringes and, and I mean, it's, it's very prescribed clearly to set the priestly class apart. Okay, I'm back. Okay, and we're still doing it today with the, the priests and the rabbis and the minister, and they change their clothing according to different times of the year and the holidays. And we we wear tefillin and talitot, right? Mm -hmm. In our services and... Um... And when they say sacral vestments, this is clothing that they only wear for sacred occasions, not every day or or did they wear this every day so that they would be distinguished from the people so it's it's interesting um i well there's called big de kodesh so holy clothes uh literally big de kodesh big de kodesh or big de kahuna in other places um and uh <laughs> You know, in, in later in temple times, there were so many Kohanim 
that they would uh, they would go in rotations to serve in the temple. Um, they weren't all at once in the temple. And my understanding is that uh, I'm not hundred percent sure of this, but that when it was the rotation, they would wear the clothes the whole time. But when they weren't in rotation, um, they would now wear it when they were back in their villages. Um, at the time of the tabernacle, um, I actually don't. I'm, I, I, don't recall it's very minutes. I'm really sorry. My daughter is calling me, so I have to go one more time. Sorry about that. Continue. You so know, they had their, early, your, go ahead. Go ahead. I, don't know, I was gonna say, so they had their their business casual clothes in their their business clothes. Oh, that's right, as do we. <laughs> but it's interesting that it says for dignity and adornment. adornment. Which yeah. are two opposite kinds of things, right? The dignity is, you know, setting them apart for what they do priestly, but yet they need to be adorned. I'm sorry, can, can you just tell me which verses that were, those words are in? I'm a little... uh, verse 2. 28, 28, 28, two. Verses what? 28, 2. 28, 2. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so the, it's for... Uh -huh. other, other might have uh, for honor or for and for beauty um, or for glory and for beauty. I don't know if anybody else has any other translation for that verse. For splendor and for beauty, I'm seeing. Okay, splendor and for beauty. Yeah, but both are what I said. So one is more, you know, I like that. How, what they do, and the other is to make them look special. Okay. But if you look special, you feel special. And if you feel special, the expectation of a priest, I would think, is that you are acting in a holy way. So... I'm wondering if the clothes then serve to set a purpose for the priest internally, like you put on these vestments and you, you, um, you think like a priest, right? I don't want to say that the vestments make the priest holy, because I believe holiness exists within and not without, but it could be that the, you know, like we, like we dress the Torah, Right. Mm -hmm. The Torah is intrinsically holy, but we, we don't need to dress it, but we do to honor it and to and to exalt it. And, um, you know, it, it <clears throat> dressing it up makes it special, even though it is intrinsically special. It just adds another layer. OK, I, I, uh, I, 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 go ahead. Somebody was about to say something. Right. Yeah, I was going to say uh... I remember you said a couple of weeks ago, Rabbi, you were talking about uh, the body being a uh, uh, some sort of a temple, right? So could it be, and this is more of a question, uh, could sure. it be more of a construction of sanctuary itself, the garments uh, for the for the priest, uh, because they represent, you know, bodily, physically, they represent that temple for God's glory. Hmm. Beautiful. I mean, it, it is, it is, we're, we're going from describing what the temple itself looked like to now describing what the clothes of the priest look like. So there is some kind of parallel that's happening there. Um, and, and I mean, it is, it is striking, you know, it, you know, is, is there, is there an intrinsic holiness to this? Is there, is there, I mean, we're, we're going to see in the commentaries, one of the commentaries say, that these clothes had to be made with a certain kavana. The clothes themselves had to be made with a certain intention. And if the clothes were made with that intention, it almost gave them a certain, a certain something. I mean, uh, the only thing that I can think of is similar, but it's when you're, I mean, when you're building the fill in, for sure, there's a lot of prayers to go into it. But even when you tie a tzitzit, you're supposed to say a prayer before you tie the tzitzit, right? So it's almost like you're imbuing. You're, you're, you're imbuing holiness into your 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 your, your vestment and, and um, <clears throat> I, I know I know people who, who believe that you know the more you wear your talit, your talit right is your prayer shawl, the more you wear your talit and prayer and meditation, it's almost as if you're you are imbuing a quality to that talit. Um, and uh, then it's kind of like an aid to meditation and certainly in the East, we have all kinds of beliefs around this. You know, they in the East in the Eastern traditions, they have traditions of uh, meditating on top of sheep skin, or the best is tiger skin, because that the, 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 
that, that there's something about the energy of tiger skin that will kind of be potent for your meditation um, of, of the dead animal will just so I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's that was the understanding here, but there, there might have been some of this, um, you know, there's so so specific in it, um, both in terms of the intention of it and in terms of the, uh, the qual the the fabrics and all of that. Uh, let's go forward a little bit and actually read a little bit of what it is, and then we'll go back and discuss because I think that that is the central verse, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll go back into that verse because it's a beautiful verse. I want to let's let's just read it a little bit just to get a sense of all of it. Um, Alan, do you mind continuing to read verse three? Sure. Next, you shall instruct all who are skillful, whom I have endowed with the gift of skill, to make Aaron's vestments for consecrating him to serve me as priest. These are the vestments they are to make: a breastplate, an ephod, a robe a fringe tunic, a headdress, and a sash. They shall make those sacral vestments for your brother Aaron and his sons for priestly service to me. They therefore shall receive the gold, the blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and the fine linen. They shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and of fine twisted linen worked into designs. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached. They shall be attached at its two ends. And the decorated band that it is upon, it shall be made like it, of one piece with it, of gold, of blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and of fine twisted linen. I think we're, we're going to just stop there because we're going to get more and more into detail of, of the stones and then we could go on for the whole parsha. But I wanted to give us a little taste of of, uh, of it. And we have here the list in verse four of all, all the different uh, parts of the dress. Um, yeah, but what's interesting is this line, next you shall instruct all who are skilled. Like within our synagogue, we have several women, not men, but women who have made their kids Talits for their barabat mitzvahs. Right. And we, and we have we have people who have who have sewn you know different things for the synagogue. Right? Oh, Marcel Fari used to make uh -huh. uh, the covers years ago for the Torahs. For Torah and, and on, yeah. the, and on the, the 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 lecterns and. Uh, oh, and the new even, ones, right? Those yes. new ones, yeah, they're beautiful. Those cloth designs that Jackie Fields made. Uh, yeah, the, they're beautiful. Uh, the sim similar kind of idea uh, for for it. Um, so let's let's go back to this ver uh, verse uh, and, and these few verses here, verses two to four, um, about it. So who for dignity and adornment um, or glory or splendor um, and beauty. Um, is it more for the priests or for the people watching them? Good question. I think it's both. Yeah. I think it's both. I think it elevates the priests and put the priests in a, in a particular class of, of separateness, of holiness, but also so that the people recognize that when they see this purple and gold and red and 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 the afad and all of you know all of the vestments that they themselves they check themselves right that they that they behave as if they're with a priest right as if they're in the presence of of somebody of God um, I think it goes both ways beautiful well and there, there there's also some commentaries that describe. You know, if you were an Israelite and you walked up to the tabernacle and you watched, you know, you watched the worship and the people there were dressed in these white robes and they had these little, right, we were, this is further down, but these little bells at the bottom of their robes that were making sounds, pomegranates, and, you know, it's just, it's all, it would, it would elevate you. You'd feel like you were watching the angels in heaven. This is the, the language they use, right? Something. We don't know how what they thought of angels exactly, but right, on its same 
on its hem make pomegranates and blue, purple, and crimson yarns all around the hem with bells of gold between them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate all around them, the, home, the hem of the robe. Um, Aaron shall wear it while officiating, so that the sound of it is heard when he comes into the sanctuary before the night when he goes out, that he may not die. And then, right, he had this frontlet. You shall make a frontlet of pure gold and engrave on it the seal inscription, Holy to Adonai. Right, so he even had a, a little kind of thing on his forehead, a metal piece that was uh, quite famous. Um, but it, it, it's interesting, um, again, to compare to what we have in our day. Um, so we obviously we don't have priests and we don't have all of this, though there are some who are preparing for the day when they hope the temple worship will continue and there's the institute in Jerusalem where they you know have recreated all of these um, but but the, the our halakh literature over millennia is said well you know our tefillin are a little bit like this and there's a there's a, a, a wonderful halakhic uh, ruling that says that our head tefillin is holier even in the front length of the high priest that says holy to Adonai that are to fill in. Uh, so we're, 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 we're to some degree, we try and recreate elements of this. And as I think I heard someone saying earlier, the Catholic and, and Eastern tradition, uh, and I guess Anglican too, to some degree, the Episcopalian try and recreate some of what was in the temple in the, in their Christian services, right? With their, with their rites um, and different, uh, the way they, they do things. Uh, Where did they get the gold? They were given it when they left. They took it when they left Egypt. Remember, they had to go to their neighbors. I, I, yeah, neighbors. I understand that. But I mean, how much gold can somebody carry? It's pretty heavy. I mean, have all that gold. Yeah. And, and why are formerly enslaved walking around the desert with gold and silver, right? <laughs> we don't use gold. I mean, maybe threads of gold, but we don't use gold gold. I mean, when you go to foreign countries like India, India, Malaysia, I mean, you're knocked out by the gold in all of their temples. Peru. Yeah, yeah, of... We know that they took Spain. <laughs> we know that they took the gold from Egypt, but they've got these fine linens and fabrics. Oh, okay. And, the, right. and, and the dyes. And if I remember correctly, the blue or the per the blue in particular. Very supposedly from a very rare animal in the Nail. sea, Snail. and here they are wandering Snail. around the middle of the desert. <laughs> right, it's, it's kind like, of hard to believe. It <laughs> doesn't say that God gave them this, but you know, it's almost like you know He's commanding them to do this, and somehow He's created a miracle to ensure that they have all that they need to fulfill his I, command. I think uh -huh. from flowers, sometimes they can make those colored. Um, yeah, they can have flowers. And threads, right. But blue, blue is a very, very difficult color to make. And up until maybe the, the Renaissance painters, blue came from lapis lazuli. Blue is a very, 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 very difficult pigment. It does not naturally occur in a lot of places. Now, purple comes from those snails and was traded by the Phoenicians. So I'm thinking they got purple dye from a trade caravan. I mean, they're in the desert, right? Aren't there trade caravans crossing the desert? We know that the Egyptians use this purple dye because we see it in their, in their artifacts. So I'm thinking this, they might have gotten this through trade in their wanderings, but blue is a very, very, very rare color up until like the 16th, 17th century when painters figured out how to make it without lapis lazuli. So, However, um, however they got it, which, you know, there's many different ways we could approach this, you know, in, in terms right. of where the text is coming from and how much they did. And it, it, something we can say also, as everybody's been pointing out how rare and difficult it is to get all this, is that they, this is obviously very important, that they were willing to put these resources into um, 
channel resources into this. This was something that was uh, of high importance um, and, and probably not many slaves had clothes of this type um, at all. Um, so they were, they were creating something that was, that was unique and, and very, very special. Um, hey, and can probably, I? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, the, the, the people who were instructed to do this in that verse two, I've just lost my place. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Um, I don't see the text in front of me anymore. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but anyway, the, the word in verse, in, in, in going back a little bit, but it's, it's the instruction is to those who are um, uh, okay. so the this translation in the in the uh, in the uh, screen or the new JPS, maybe it is, is um, the skillful. JPS. The traditional translation and alter translation is more literal minded. Uh, wise, wise hearted, something like wise that. Hearted. And yeah. and I wondered if, if, since these are the people who are supposed to do these things, is that is do you think there's a a different view here implied of that this is merely a matter of skill rather than of something else, or am I reading the wrong thing into it? I, I uh, well, I, I can see where you're coming from because the the the, the Hebrew itself uh, and its plain meaning is saying. You know, and to go speak to all those who are wise of heart, um, with who have been filled with the spirit, the wind of wisdom. So that doesn't sound just like regular intelligence or skill. That sounds like a pretty, that sounds like a spiritual ability. Um, you know, sounds like, a, is that what you're getting to? That That's exactly my like concern. And I don't know what the spirit. answer is. It was only raising that question. Okay, I found uh, this. Biblical dye also not just purple, was made from snails. An Israeli researcher identified more than 2,000-year-old textile that contained a mysterious blue dye described in the Bible, one of the few remnants of the ancient color ever found. So I yeah. guess, you know, there are people that have found these things. So, so that, that's, that's why, um, you know, here, I'll just grab my talit. So th this, is, this is a recent finding, right, for centuries, for many, many centuries, we thought we had lost the color to chelet, right? And it's only re not fairly recently that people believe they found it again and started to put on talitot again, right? This is, right, this is the chelet, the, the blue, right? Mm -hmm. One, there's two different ideas. One that's more of a purple, one is more of this blue. So this is made with those snails, mm -hmm. snail color. You know, it's, uh, I'm sorry to all the snails who are, uh, <laughs> uh, were affected by my created my talit, but I um, there is there is something spiritual happening here. The literal translation here, right? The, so there's something special physically, as Norma and everybody's been saying, right? You know, to go make a dye made from snails and live in the sea sounds like a labor-intensive, expensive. <laughs> but there's also it's saying here that the people who were made this had to have a had to be endowed with a spirit of wisdom. And be wise of heart. So that means it wasn't just anybody making this, and they had to have a certain um, something. Uh, and, and this is an idea that we still have in Judaism, right? Where the person who writes a Torah scroll isn't just a random person writing a Torah scroll. They've got to go to the mikvah at certain points. You know, they've got to. You would expect them to have certain attributes and qualities. You know, when you're creating a holy object, you need to have your mind should be in a certain place. You know, you shouldn't be creating a holy object when you're just completely in um, thinking about inappropriate or on un, mundane matter. You know, so there, there's we have this idea going back all the way here that uh, you know the uh, holy object created in a holy way uh, creates some kind of divine chemistry, and that's important. Yeah, yeah, Rabbi, if I can say something. Um, sure. I was just thinking about what Norma was just uh, reading right now. And I remember there's another portion that talks about um, another parasha that talks about skin of dolphin, right? And mm -hmm. where does it come from, right? So we asked this question, what is it, where did they, where did they get a skin of dolphin in the desert, right? So, but it takes us back to the time they crossed the ocean, uh, the Red Sea, what do they have access to there, right? We never really think about 
the Red Sea opened up, but there was so much there. What was on the ground sitting there that they could have picked up and taken with them, right? right? So <laughs> it's just I was just thinking about that as Norma was just talking about. <laughs> it's, no, no, it's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting you should bring them up. And I hope, can you all see my screen now? You're going to, the, 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 dolph, the, the dolphin skin is, we're unsure exactly what it is. And then we have all kinds of interesting ideas. Um, and it's interesting that we'd have, it we kept of dolphin skins, but here we're going to uh, uh, we're going to look at the commentaries together. Just as a, it's a fun thing to do. So, dolphin skin um, here. Rashi, Rashi on dolphin skin. Um, yeah, yeah, Hachash. It was a it was a kind was a kind of wild beast. It existed only at that time when Israel built a tabernacle. It was multicolored, and therefore it is translated in the Targum. This is a translation anyway. Um, and prides itself with its colors. So Rashi is just inventing, he's saying some kind of some kind of wild beast that existed only at that time. Um, others say it was probably just some kind of leather. Others are saying dolphin skin. So we're let's see if we've been Ezra some. Um, seal skins, techashim, seals, refers to a type of animal that was known then um, in biblical times. However, we can no longer identify it. Um, who knows, right? Uh, we, we uh, let's see, let's see. So the other, the, for all of these, right? We have this question for all of these things. And we, we talked about this last year when we were talking about um, on Sukkot, they were, they were to build all the booths, right? Where did they get the wood to build a booth for 2 million people? Middle of the, right, right in the middle of the desert. So then there's, you know, if you go back to all the different stops, you know, so the commentator said, well, at that stop, there might have been a whole bunch of trees there that they cut down. And um, others say, well, they carried with them out of Egypt all this wood. It's like, really? <laughs> that's all that's a, they carried enough wood to build a little booth for every family. That's a lot of wood. Um, <laughs> So the, these questions uh, have, have have kind of mystified people for for thousands of years um, because there's no easy answers to it, and scholars have their views, of course, about how different layers of texts are constructed and brought together, and how many are contemporary with each other, and all of this. And um, you know, uh, we <clears throat> we'll never know, you know, unless we can get little clues here and there from archaeology, but we we don't. We don't always know, um, and uh, it, but it does tell us um, reading through this about what were the values that uh, were, were tried to that were conveyed about these different elements and, and and ideas about holy objects and holy materials and how you create holiness, um, which I think is still a, an interesting and valid conversation. And look, we we say when you. When you create a synagogue, every synagogue has certain features for it to be a synagogue. It has to have a window. It has to, um, I mean, we don't do this, but it says, you know, the, there, were, there should be candles when you walk in and you light not on Shabbat. Um, and there are different things to, to create a sense of awe. And when you, when you went into it, when you go into a synagogue, um, there's, there's a prohibition on talking about light matters. You know, loud, you know, because you're supposed to have a gravity um, to upkeep the sense of holiness. So we, 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 we all we express this in different ways through the ages, how we create holy place and holy, holy, uh, you know, it's the same. So the, the, we have this. Uh, what's the equivalent? We dress up when we go to shul, right? Well, we used to. I don't know that everybody still does that. <laughs> Not everybody still does that as much, right? But there's a, and it depends where. In, in, in the Midwest, people really still dress up, you know, and you go to the California, no, nobody dress, nobody wears a suit and tie, including the rabbi and cantor, um, unless there's a big event. So, you know, but, but, but there, there was a sense of, and, and it says in Jewish law that you should dress differently on Shabbat than you do the rest right. of the week. Right. You should dress differently to give to honor Shabbat. Um, and so when you go to Jerusalem, I, it's one of my favorite things to do when you're walking to the Kotel on Shabbat and you you see all the Hasidim who usually wear 
unusual clothes, but when they went on Shabbat, some of them wear these beautiful multicolored gold and kind of these kind of shimmering gold uh, robes um, and different. They wear their best fur hats and you know all this stuff. You know, it's a, it's a they really they dress up. You know, they wear the they wear the five thousand dollars shrimal instead of the you know the <laughs> the five hundred dollar hat or whatever it is. Um, so there is a sense of dressing up. Uh, to, to have, so not everybody is into this, right? Some people think, what's the point? It's all in, internal. And other people feel it, it, it lends a sense of a distinguishment and of specialness. And um, the, only, the image that's coming to my mind um, for me is on, on Pesach, right? On Passover, when I put, we put our best tablecloths on our extended table for our guests. And we take out all of our silver and beautiful plates, and I wear my uh, um, uh, my special robe, and we all and suddenly the room feels very special. It almost feels like a, there's a sense of something going on there, you know. Uh, so I, you know, there's a sense that somehow the external can create a sense of grandeur and of beauty to it. Um, So we're going, to, we're going to look at the commentaries in a sec, but maybe a, a final question. What, what, do, what do you make of using intentionality to create a holy object or a holy, uh, <clears throat> a holy clothes? Or if, or, or if anybody else wanted to share a time of seeing either our religion or in other religions, people wearing special clothes and feeling a sense of being uplifted or inspired or of being carried to a different place. Well, it used to be at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, everybody looked for, I mean, I belonged to the synagogue for 55 years, felt really excited to come and see how everybody looked because mm -hmm. people did look very special. And it made you feel good. But not so much anymore. Well, it's sort of played down, you know. Yeah. We we saw something in uh, uh, north of Singapore, walking up uh, to a holy place, uh, many many steps. Uh, there it was a holiday, and there was a guy inside of a cage, special kind of a cage, and he was walking slowly up these steps, and the cage actually went through his hands and uh, parts of his skin um, and he he had he had uh, you know a very stressed look on his face but the cage the, the architecture of the cage interested me in this thing so it was almost through the architecture of the cage that they were trying to get at something maybe uh, supposedly the shape of the human soul who knows what you know in my, my sense is if we knew uh, if I knew what an ephod was, I mean, what is the shape of an ephod uh, specifically? We, we well, really we... don't know that these days, do we? I looked that up, actually, David. I looked up what an ephod was, and in Merriam-Webster, it says it is a linen apron worn by the priests. But it also right. says, but it also says as a tertiary definition that it was it was uh something used by yeah. to foretell, right? To to predict the future to or to cast well, what, was the well, what was the shape? So how are the color how are the colors oriented? What was the symmetry structure of the thing? Those are the things that would interest me because those things I feel are somehow important, and the, uh, by analogy, by analogy, you can feel something if you meditate on those things. You you can we, feel something internal created in yourself as sort of uh, as an analogy of those external things. The truth is, we don't really know what an ifot is. Um, we we think you know we, we have a sense of what it probably is based on the context. But the word ifod, as, as a dictionary says, um, is used um, in all kinds, in, in different ways. And there are stories in the ifod where it seems to be almost used like a, a type of 
not not a, a picture of a deity, but almost as something that's worshipped or closed or kept as a almost as an as an idol or as something like that. Um, a, a wonderful story in, in the book of Judges, specifically, and or several stories about an ephod that's taken up and taken down, and um, or but but somehow it seems to be an object of spiritual power. Um, before we read this Rashi, because Rashi also doesn't know what an ephod is. You know, when I when I lived in uh, in Kathmandu um, for a year with an Israeli organization doing humanitarian work, we lived next to a very important Buddha, Tibetan Buddhist area called Swayambu. Um, and there was a hill uh, where there were maybe about 10 to 20 uh, large Tibetan monasteries and thousands of monks and priests would walk around and um, they've got this all down in their religion. I mean, you go to, there was one place, I once led a Yom Kippur retreat in a, a Buddhist monastery up there when I was there. Um, and, you know, you walk in and it's, you're above the clouds um, and everything is decorated and all the priests are wearing their gear and they have these huge horns making big noises and it's all very, very, uh, you know, ev evocative of this. Um, and then that, those are the monks and, and the nuns, I guess there's nuns too, but the people themselves, they have all kinds of things. And this is why I was thinking of an ephod. Um, and I actually have one somewhere that I brought and I'll, if I think of it, I'll try and bring it next time. I don't know where it is, um, but they have these things that they wear. It's like a, a, like a shrine. Um, these are just like your, your kind of uh, people who go on pilgrimage. It's a box that they wear and inside they fill the box with different strange materials like grains and grasses, and um, they, the, the the thing is is decorated in a certain way, um, and they wear it when they go on pilgrimage, and they feel that at the shrine it's they wear it on their chest. Um, but if you really want to get one that's worth something, is you give it to a master, and that master will wear it for a month, and then give it back to you for you know, a big donation to his temple. Um, but then you'll feel that that box has been imbued with the vibrations of the meditations of that master and of his. And so these, and then you can buy them as antiques and they'll tell you this one was worn by so-and-so Rinpoche or however um, in there for periods of time. Um, and, they, and they feel that the materials inside of these little shrines can conserve the vibrations or the the energies of the thing, and so I feel the ephod has some of that quality in the way it's described in our tradition that it's something to be worshipped and that holds a certain power to it. Um, that's not here. Uh, I was somehow someone gave me one when I was in Nepal. That I, uh, it's it's very beautiful, um, and then they had, there's like a little a Buddha image in it, um, and inside. Um, somewhere I have it somewhere in the box somewhere I'll, I'll have to bring it out and, and show it to, to people um, but it's uh, yeah it's a, it's a very it's, a, it's it's kind of interesting it's an ancient way of looking at at holy objects um, and so here this is this is Rashi and an ephod will somebody read for us please um, may I read it um, sure go ahead I have heard no tradition nor have I found in the Baraita any description of its shape, pardon me, but my own mind tells me that it was tied on behind him. Its breadth was the same as the breadth of a man's back, like a kind of apron, which is called poursin in old French. I guess he knew he was speaking old French, which ladies of rank tie on when they ride on horseback. Mm -hmm. Such as mentioned was the way in which the lower part was made, as it is said, Second Samuel, and David was girded with a linen ephod, this re informs us that the ephod was something tied on the body. It is, however, not possible to say that it consisted of a girdle only, because it is said, Leviticus, and he put the ephod upon him. And afterwards it is stated, and he girded him with the uh, hoshev of the ephod. And this uncle is translated by the girdle of the ephod. This therefore informs us that hoshev is the girdle and the ephod is the name of the ornamental garment itself. Further, it is not possible to assert that it was on account of the two shoulder straps that it was called ephod, uh, 
i.e. that the term ephod applies to these two straps and the girdle to which they were attached, for it is said, the two shoulder pieces of the ephod. This tells us that the ephod is a separate name, the shoulder pieces a separate name, and the girdle a separate name. So I, I, I don't think we're going to read all of it uh, because it's he's getting into yeah. some language, some language uh, which I, I find I, I'm not I'm not convinced by it because he's he's kind of reading language midrashically to try and figure out what a nifod is, which is interesting, but I'm not sure it's actually going to tell us what a nifod is. Um, but I, what, the reason I wanted to bring that uh, and I included it in my source sheet was also to give us a sense of he says I have no tradition for what this is. And so for a lot of these things, these are traditions that are passed down generation to generation for centuries and millennia. And some of them we just don't know. And a lot of them are probably false because the tradition, you know, we've opened where we play, what's it called, the telephone, you know, where you, you know, things are lost where things actually are pretty easily. Um, so we, we just don't know for a lot of this and scholars will, you know, do their scholarship. But and, then, and there's there's a surprisingly amount of things that are like that. Um, let's go, let's go to, uh, Ibn Ezra, um, and thou shalt make holy garments. Someone read for us, please. And thou shalt make holy garments. They are called holy garments because they were worn during the sanctuary service. On the other hand, it is possible that they were called holy garments in accordance with that they sanctify not the people with their garments, Ezekiel. In other words, the garments had the power to sanctify those whom they touched. The garments per se were holy. Hmm. So that's an interesting idea, right? That just uh, the garments themselves were holy by putting them on, whoever touched them would be imbued with their holiness. Okay. Let's for continue splendor, reading. Here. For splendor and for beauty, they shall glorify themselves with these garments. For no other Israelite shall wear similar garments. Okay. And then, right. Go ahead, Ramban. Then Ramban says, "And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for splendor and beauty. This means that he be distinguished and glorified with garments of distinction and beauty. For these garments of the high priest correspond in their forms to garments of royalty." which monarchs wore at the time when the Torah was given. Thus we find, with reference to the tunic, and he made him a tunic of pasin, meaning a cloth woven of variegated colors, this being the tunic, tunic of checker work mentioned here, just as Ibn Ezra explained, which clothed him as a son of, as a son of ancient king. The mitre, right, the mitre mentioned here, is to this day known among kings and distinguished lords. The plate around the forehead, which the high priest wore, is like a king's crown. Thus it is written, Yatzitz Nisro, his crown will shine. Furthermore, the high priest's garments are made of gold, blue purple, red purple, which are all symbolic of royalty. As for the blue purple, even to this day, no man will lift up his hand to wear it except a king of nations. I want to look through those instead of sitting doing nothing, Howard. Look through them. Except to wear it, except a king of nations. And it is written, and Mordecai went forth from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a great crown of gold and with a tachrich, a robe of fine linen and purple, the tachrich being a robe in which the wearer wraps himself. So it's what we were saying. These are very valuable, but it's, they were to be this. We didn't. God did not want to create a kingship, but this is the equivalent of a kingship. A king, you know, the the priests were to wear the clothes of, of royalty of nobles. Um, let's do a little bit more of this. This is a little bit more obscure, but I think we're worth worthwhile. By way of the truth, the mystic teachings of the Kabbalah, Majesty is to kavod and to Tithereth splendor, the verse thus stating that they should make holy garments for Aaron to minister in them to the glory of God who dwells in their midst and to the splendor of their strength. 
So Why somehow not? they were they were channeling those qualities. They were they were matching. They were becoming vessels for those powerful emanations. Um, uh, where are those clothes? Go ahead. So clothes do make the man here. Yep. <laughs> clothes do make the man. Um, and the verse stating that they should make holy garments for our own to minister in them to the glory of God who dwells in their midst and to the splendor of their strength. Likewise, he says further with respect to the garments of all of our own sons, that they are for splendor and for beauty. The priestly garments had to be made with the intention to be used for that purpose. It is possible that in making them intent of heart, for what they symbolize was also needed on the part of their makers. Yeah, we've talked about that. It is for this reason that he said, and thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, who will understand what they will do. And the rabbis have already said of Alexander the Great that when asked by his generals why he descended from his chariot to bow before the high priest Simon the Just, he answered, his image glistened before me whenever I had a victory. His image glistened before me. Okay. It's a, a midrash. About fast, there's, a, there, there's a whole series of fascinating midrashim with Alexander the Great and the Greeks and all of their, all of their uh, conquests and all kinds of interesting, wild things. Um, <laughs> But this idea that the, the the beauty of the high priest, the spiritual power of the high priest was evident to even Alexander the Great, right? To the greatest conqueror of, of, of ancient times. Um, so let's continue, actually. I want to get to Rabbeinu Bach and others, but uh, uh, we're, we're really exploring all the different things we've talked about and, and see how they've, they're also taking it. Um, another level. Okay, so four no. Nancy, do you mind continuing? Sure. Le kivod, to render honor and glory to the Almighty through the wearing of such resplendent garments when performing temple services. Okay. That Hebrew I cannot read. Tifaret, yeah. Also, the priest should inspire awe among the Israelites who are all considered his disciples seeing that he had the names of all the tribes engraved on these garments right opposite his heart when he wore them in his official capacity. So, so the priest is literally carrying the high priest the is tribe, carrying the, the, high the tribes. Yeah. The tribes. Yeah. He had already had he had the breastplate of the 12 stones for the 12 tribes. So it was, it was beautiful to see someone who was representing you Right, he you knew he represented you because he had a stone of your tribe on his breastplate, and he was representing you, but also wore these beautiful clothes. So it, it kind of reflected onto your own personal sense of, of feeling connected. Um, getting to a little bit more Kabbalah here, but I thought it was interesting. Um, go ahead, uh, Nancy, please. Or Chaim. Alternatively. God wanted to give us a reason why the Torah commanded that the high priest wear eight garments, four made of white linen and four containing gold. The Torah says that the reason is for splendor and for beauty. We find the following comment in the introduction of Tikkunei Has Zohar. Zohar. An Zohar. addition to the Zohar. Yeah. The Zohar. Okay. The four golden garments are an illusion to the four letters in the ineffable name, whereas the four white linen garments are an allusion to the four letters in God's name. Aleph, Dalit, Nun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. We should remember that the ineffable name reflects God's attribute of- Tiferet, of splendor. Yeah. Okay, of splendor, whereas God's Beauty. name, Reflects Adonai. his attribute, kavod. Kavod, yeah. According to this, the word splendor in our verse would refer to the golden garments, whereas the word la kavod would refer to the white garments. The Torah listed varying degrees of holiness in ascending order. Hence, the attribute la kavod precedes the attribute splendor. Showing you how these things are all mapped out into um, kind of meditative and spiritual 
things and, and, and a sense that they, they really felt, I think one way to understand it is that they felt that God's very presence was imbued into all of the symbolism, you know, four of this and four of that and the colors and the shapes. It's like literally they, God was in these clothes, right? They were holy, they were special, there was something about them. Um, Malbim, a commentator we don't often have stuff, but I thought uh, from, but I, I liked his comment on this. Um, uh, someone else, somebody else like to read for us. I can read, Rami. Okay. Thank uh, you. And you shall make sacred garments. Behold, the garments that he commanded to make were ostensibly outer garments, such that their makeup is discussed, how the craftsmen are to make them with their work. But they really indicate inner clothes that the priests of God should make to clothe their souls with thoughts and traits and proper tendencies, which are the clothes of the soul. And the craftsmen did not make those garments, but God commanded Moses that he should make these sacred garments, meaning to teach them how to refine their souls and traits in such a way they will wear majesty and splendor upon their internal souls. Hmm. Nice. Beautiful, right? Yeah. Say Beautiful. You're saying it wasn't so much about the external, but they were to remind you that you had to wear, so to speak, internal garments of being a good person and of being a, a holy person. And you wore those. And I, I think that strikes intuitively true to us, at least as moderns, that, you know, when, I mean, people talk about this, right? When you're wearing a kippah, you know, you, you feel like, oh, I've got to behave in a certain way, right? Because I'm wearing a kippah, you know, you, uh, so, or, uh, you know, for other other things as well. So a sense that when you're wearing these clothes, it reminded you of the kind of inner clothes you had to wear um, to to match that outer that outer aspect. Um, uh, good, Norma, please go ahead. Read Rabbeinu Bachu for glory and splendor. For glory and splendor, according to the plain meaning of these words, the meaning is that the wearers of these garments will be honored and glorified by them, seeing that in the eyes of even the distinguished individuals among the people, the high priest is considered like an angel of the Lord, as far as his performing the sacrificial service is considered, is concerned. The Torah now commanded that his external appearance be comparable to that image which these people have of him by dressing him in garments reflecting his lofty assignment. So even, even another level is saying, you know, I God expects the priests and the high priests to be almost otherworldly, right? They want, want them to be these spiritual beings. And so I'm giving you these garments for you to remember your your Yes, you're, you know, you're, you're a human being like everybody else, but when you put on these garments and you're doing the worship, you're like, you're like an angel. Um, okay, now this is a, 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 a thing, final piece of Talmud I'd like us to read, um, which takes, uh, brings another aspect, and then we'll pull it all together. Um, someone read this uh, Talmud for us. Oh, go ahead. Xavier, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the tunic atones for bloodshed, as it is stated with regard to the brothers of Joseph after they plotted to kill him. And they killed a goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. Genesis 37 31. The trousers atone for forbidden sexual relations, as it is stated with regard to fashioning the priestly vestments. And you shall make them linen trousers to cover the flesh of their nakedness. Exodus 28 42. The mitre atones for the arrogant. For where is this derived? Rabbi Hanina says, it is logical that an item that is placed at an elevation, i.e. on the head of a priest, shall come and atone for the sin of an elevated heart. Hmm. Rabbi Inini Bar Sasson continues, the bell atones for thought of the heart. The Gemara elaborates, the belt atones for the sins occurring where it is situated, i.e. over the heart. The breastplate of the high priest atones for improper judgments, as it is stated, and you shall make a breastplate of judgment, Exodus 28, 15. The ephod of the high priest atones for idol worship, as it is stated, and without ephod or teraphim, Hosea 3, 4, meaning that when there is no ephod, the sin of teraphim, i.e. idol worship, is found. Therefore, it may be inferred 
that if there isn't a font, there is no sin of idol worship. The robe of the high priest atones for malicious speech. For where is this known? Rabbi Hanina says, it is logical that an item that produces sound, i.e. the robe, which has the bells, shall come and atone for an evil sound. And the front plate of the high priest atones for abrasiveness. This is derived from the fact that with regard to the front plate, it is written, and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, Exodus 28, 38. And with regard to brazenness, it is written, and you had a harlot's forehead, Jeremiah 3, 3. Thank you. So what, what is this saying? You know, it's saying that the high priest, right, we know from the Yom Kippur, um, the Day of Atonement, uh, verses, he had the power to atone for the whole people, right? And so here it's saying that the different elements of the of the dress atoned for different improper uh, conduct um, within the whole people. So how, what does that even mean? Um, how, how, how I maybe can pull this all together um, from my point of view is that um, there is a sense that the that the worship of the priests had a quality, had a, an ability to affect the spiritual um, health of the whole nation, right? That's kind of the whole basis of the whole idea, right? That somehow what happened there in the tabernacle um, could help people, even if they weren't themselves doing the work of atoning for their own stuff, that somehow the work happening in the tabernacle had the spiritual power to remove the sins of other people. That's an incredibly powerful idea, right? Um, and But for that to happen, there had to be all the ingredients there, all the different things had to be in place to be the proper vessels for that spiritual power to kind of come into the world. Um, and it, it, it's, it's kind of um, at the very basis of biblical religion, right? This idea that um, we all incur problems and things and what are what are transgressions and sins those are all the things that we go through our lives and where we feel out of line yeah. right we feel what's 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 atonement atonement yeah. right one of the ways of looking at it so okay when yeah. you don't feel when you feel out of when you feel out of sync um with uh with yourself um, and you feel you've transgressed the Lord, meaning you don't feel good within yourself, something's wrong within you, um, usually you have to work out your own stuff. Um, but that there was a belief that religion, what happened in the tabernacle, what happens in synagogue, had the power to help remove those blockages and return you to harmony with yourself, with God, with the world around you, and thereby incur blessing and all the good things. Um, and that somehow there was a divine chemistry to all of this, how the clothes were, um, how uh, everything was shaped, um, and maybe it was all about alignment of body and soul, of external and internal. Um, but this is the fascinating world of these chapters we're reading about, that there is alignment between internal and external, and that there is, and that we still have some kind of ability to affect our internal by our external, um, and to clear away all of our own blockages, um, to come back to spiritual well-being and health and oneness, um, and not only for ourselves, but we're part of a collective, and a prayer um, for ourselves and for the Jewish world and for Israel, that all of our work together um, can help bring harmony and justice and joy and peace and well-being, um, both through our internal spiritual actions and through our external um, actions in the world, um, to our planet, to Israel, to the Jewish people. See you next week.